Welcome to the Massage Tools Podcast, your home for cool interviews and reviews. Things off, will you tell us some of your experiences as a sport massage therapist? Well, um, I started um, very early in my life uh, working on other athletes besides, um, you know, just in my high school, I worked on people that were doing other sports. I was a swimmer in high school. I was, uh, I went quite a ways with swimming myself. I'd say you went uh, quite a ways. Was, yeah. <laughs> just, just I, a little bit. <laughs> as, as a swimmer, I was a alternate to the 72 Olympics. So, um, I didn't get to go because Mark Spitz went. <laughs> and for people who don't know that that was michael phelps before michael phelps <laughs> like yes he's... yes and uh he got like seven medals you know himself so um i was a shadow behind him <laughs> so but um i i worked with a lot of my associated friends in high school long before i ever got really trained as a massage therapist um, and it was more you know I call it by intuitive years and from that I then um, got involved in a lot of different a- athletic things myself besides swimming and uh, Tom can I pause you for just one moment sure. for anybody that didn't listen to our podcast when you started your initial massage career there weren't massage schools yet and there weren't licensure there weren't mis- requirements. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll do respect. It was kind of the wild west then. So, you know, you came into yeah. it with a very ethical and genuine practice, but for anybody who like has their hackles up, he's like a high schooler working on other pe-, you know, so it's, it was, it yeah. was, uh, uh, within, within the bounds at the time, but well, so. I'll start over then. This is my 52nd year doing massage (laughs) and state licensure in the state of Washington has only been around for 35 of those years. So, um, I, I was, uh, instructed on how to do massage by a doctor to take care of my father. And from that, I then started working on my friends and associates and, um, built a barter system business for a long time. Um, but after, after I decided to go back to school and and get my education in massage, I was still very interested in athletics. And um, I really enjoyed running events and and, uh, bicycling events and things like that. And the Washington sports massage team, which I was one of the people who helped get that started, um, started in 1988 Um, and Over the years, they've done as many as 40 different events in each calendar year as a part of the team. And it was a team that was built on um, getting the massage therapist better education towards massage, towards sports massage, and also um, working and influencing the event directors that it was a a beneficial thing for their runners, swimmers, whatever. Um, And so that was something that I, it's kind of my legacy now because I'm the one that's still around and a lot of the other people have gone by the wayside and I'm still an active um, advisor to that team as well as if I'm going to be relocated to Washington, I'm going to be back doing events just as often as as I possibly can. But because of that, and um, kind of the outshoot of the Washington sports massage team was I found out about the national, the AMTA national sports massage team. And so I went through the training to do that and took the um, written test and practical test for the national team and became a member of the event sports massage education council as a as an instructor and one of my jobs was to be the lead examiner 
for the practical for that exam. All that being said, I just continued to do things with sports massage from the moment I got out of school on. I was able to work with um, a number of entities. One was a sports medicine clinic, one was an athletic club, and, and all of those things I was constantly networking and finding more people that I could talk with about the benefits of sports massage. Through that, I was able to work at the 1980 Goodwill Games that was held here in Seattle. Okay. That was kind of my first big event that I'd ever done. I also worked on the Commonwealth Games in Vancouver. I worked on the Pan Am Games. And I can't remember which which one that was. Anyway, I worked at a Pan Am game. I worked at an event called the World Veterans Championships, which is all athletes over 45. Okay. And um, that was held in Eugene, Oregon. I think that was in 92. I have worked with um, pro sports, NC2A sports, and um, a number of individual teams. There's an event um, in Bellingham, Washington, that is called the Ski to Sea Race. And we would go up and work on the people the night before is a pre-event um, package. And the people that we were contracted to work with were the disabled athletes northwest these every one of the athletes had a disability of one nature or another that opened a completely other door for me and i was able to work at the pan the olympic games and the and the olympic games both in atlanta uh, later i was a i was a consultant for the salt lake city games which is a winter game and so is the Vancouver game. So I've worked with three different ones and I consulted a little bit with the group that was gonna go to Greece and do the, the um, games in Greece. So I've worked with the uh, Seattle Supersonics and that was uh, quite an interesting tale just to get into that because Pat Archer, who was one of my instructors, gathered about five or six of us together. And um, because she knew the trainer from when he was working with um, World Team Tennis, and he was the main trainer for the Sonics, he allowed us to come and start working with them in the facility. And um, that was an experience in and of itself, just being in that environment with them. From that, because those athletes talked to other athletes in town, I was able to also work on athletes from the Mariners and from the um, Seattle Seahawks, but that was on an individual basis. And then again, through Pat Archer, I got to start working with NC2A swimming and diving and I've worked for about six different schools um, doing that. University of Washington, Washington State, um, Stanford, USC, Arizona, um, Air Force, and um, Louisville. So I'm all over the board. <laughs> yeah. If there's a sport massage to be done, you've, you've kind of done it. All right, I gotcha, I gotcha. <laughs> I, I tell my students I've worked in every possible corner of this industry. I've worked in spas, I've worked in, you know, um, clinics, I've worked in, you know, athletic clubs, I've worked a, any kind of work that you can think of, I've done it. Um, I like some better than others, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, but I, uh, my claim to fame, I guess, would be I never said no. If somebody asked me to do something, sure, you know, if I have the time, I'm going to do it. Um, so 
that's that's kind of the the history. Okay. As, okay. As we say. <laughs> So um, you've worked in all these different industries or, or different corners of massage therapy. What's kind of your favorite part about the sport, sport massage? Like what's, what's a pro to working in that? Well, I, just the way that I function, I like looking at somebody's gait and seeing what I can do differently. I, I like to watch swimmers as they're making their turns and see if I can help them to do that more efficiently. Um, I had a swimmer that was um, a miler. And um, by the time we got done with him on his senior year, he'd cut two minutes out of his mile. Whoa. <laughs> and I'm, I'm certain from what he told me that he wouldn't have been able to do that without the help of the massage people, not just myself, but the, the whole massage group that was working with them. Um, I, I'm hesitant to say that I made something happen. You know, I didn't take a single stroke. I didn't <laughs> run a single step. They did it. It's, you know, so. it's a team effort, you know, with each, yes. you know, whether you're working with other professionals and yourself and then the athlete or, you know, any of our clients, it's like, ah, you know, I, I've described it often as, um, I try to bring, uh, uh, enlightenment's too strong. I try to bring information to the athlete through, you know, kinesthetic or tactile means. I mean, they feel this. Okay. And then that awareness is what helps them tweak what they need. And then it's the reps on that tweak and, yeah, as an as a idea behind it, but one of the statements that one of my instructors once told me he says, "We're like a Visa card; we only present the possibilities. They have to pay the bill." <laughs> <You know? laughs> so. yeah. That's great. So those are the that's that's uh, I love that anecdote. Those are the pros. What are the cons to working in sport massage? Well, um, in some ways people can be cubby holes and they only do this or they only do that um so i i've watched you work you've watched me work um people have asked me in the past what kind of massage do i do i can't answer that i do tom massage <laughs> i've stolen information from so many different places i can't say that i'm doing one thing or another but uh I think that's the important thing about being in the industry is show your versatility and you'll be there for a lot longer. If you're just cubby told so that you can only do one thing next week, that might not be the hot thing to do, you know? So, you know, you and I both saw what cupping did or taping did in, in the industry as far as the um, NC2As. When one person comes out and they look like they've been attacked by a mad octopus, everybody else thinks that that's a good thing to do. Or they come out and they've got so much tape on that you don't know whether their muscles are working at all. <laughs> it's, you know, there's so many trends that happen. And staying in front of all those trends, that might not be the best thing either, but at least know what is going on. Okay. You know, taping, taping is a really good tool if it's used properly. It's, yes. It can be very unfortunate if people use it incorrectly. Same thing with the cupping. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a number of different techniques out there the scraping tools just look like torture to me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know it's. I, I do a fair amount of instrument work and there are a couple CEU providers out there that they kind of push um, like minimum effective dose if you wanted to use that term or like, so they're really just working the skin until it gets like just the normal flush to it. And they're not trying to get the patechia or whatnot. So there's, you know, variations, but I came up through traditional Chinese medicine with my original schooling. So that gua sha, like you did, you the whole idea behind it, they have a whole philosophy and their medicine systems built around that, that bringing up that upwelling of the patechia. But there's, I don't know if that's necessarily 
or I'm, I'm at a point now where I think that's rarely appropriate. There are probably some indications, but that's you're getting into very specific cases as opposed to general treatment strategy. But that's that's well, my philosophy. And, and I've had the discussion with people about cupping, about it leaving the bruise. Well, excuse me, a bruise is broken capillaries. Physiologically, that's going to have to repair. Sure. So did you free things up for today and tomorrow? They're going to be all stuck together again. You know, that, you know, I, I think we need to know more than just what's happening today. We have to look at it in a continuum. And that's the important thing about what we're doing. You know, I can change somebody's gait in a minute and a half, but is that going to help them? <laughs> you know, right. You know, are they, are their muscles trained to be in that new position? You know, uh, is the splinting that was going on in their body necessary so that they can move? Yeah. Um, you know, those are the kinds of things that we have to look at, not just, oh, you're stuck. I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of that. Yeah. So um, why is it, why is it struck? You know? Yeah. I am asked from time to time, you know, what's, what's my Kelly's definition of sport massage and, a lot of times I'm like, it's, it's not a specific technique. It's the knowing when to apply the appropriate technique. Yeah. And it's an attitude that is brought to it. And what I tell people is what you will see most frequently when we're doing what is called sports massage is things that are a different pace, maybe a different depth, we might be working without any emollient of any sort and we're working through clothing. That's the things that are kind of the earmarks of all of the different kinds of things that we can call sports massage. Um, the athletes get really upset with you when you put a lot of oil on their outfit. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's not going to do a whole lot of good yeah. either. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, I've had students say, well, what all do you take to an event? I said, what I, the, the minimum that I take, you know, is my table, film, some sheets and, and my bolsters and that's it. You know, I don't have to take lotions. I don't have to take all of these other devices with me, but you know, some of the vibration tools are coming into a real big, you know, focus mm -hmm. for a lot of people. And there's some wonderful ways to use those kinds of things, but I wouldn't do a whole hour with a vibration tool mm -hmm. by any means. So, yeah. so that's neat. So, I mean, we, we've kind of talked about cupping and the instrument assisted work and taping and whatnot. Are there, Without trying to, you know, keep up with the Joneses type of mentality, is there a really beneficial CEU for someone who's looking at getting into sport, or even maybe someone who's been in it for a while that that you find that's been probably the more or the most beneficial? Well, anything that's going to do, um, going to teach you about posture and gait is going to be a great direction to go because if the person is so far off of their gravity lines that they're, you know, yes, you can, you can hit a baseball from a bad stance, but you can hit it a lot further if you've got the right stance. Um, you, can, you can run from here to there, but you can run from here to there more comfortably if your body is, is working properly. Um, those are the kinds of things that I would, I would stress is get it so that your eye can see what's going on with the body. You know, you and I have stood on a lot of pool decks and looked at some really poor posture on pool decks. Mm -hmm. And the teams that I've worked for, they learn very quickly that I'm not going to let them stand there with their knees locked back and their sway back and all of that because that's not helping them in the long run. That's their habit, but that's a, a habit that they need to change. Um, but at the same time, I also tell a lot of the people that I teach um, 
sports massage too, that if you're not familiar with a type of athlete because you've never done that, you need to go watch that person practice for that. If you've never worked on rowers, you better go watch them. You know, you're not going to get a chance to go out on the water with them, <laughs> but you'll probably have to watch them in the in the workout room and see how they train their bodies. If you've never worked on a pole vaulter, you better watch him do what he has to do or she has to do so that you can understand how they're going to use their body once they take off running. And, so, and we're in a very fortunate time right now because you can YouTube and watch. You can watch Olympic pole vaulters. You can watch high school, regionals. You can see all levels of of the sport. And it's, as you, it's ideal to see the athlete you are going to work with, but to get a general idea of the mechanics involved, like, God, the Internet's a, a blessing in that case. So. Yeah, and, and that's, I guess, what I'm saying is if you aren't aware, if you get a call and say, I've got, you know, a whole bunch of rugby players that want to have work and you've never seen a rugby game, you better get on the Internet and start watching rugby and see how they use their body. Um, I have plenty of stories about those kinds of things, you know, where people come in and they have no earthly idea of what the athlete is going through. Um, also, it's a really good idea to know who the trainers are that have been working with these people because they're actually your boss. <laughs> yeah, you got to please that person too. Of course. You know? Yeah. In our last podcast, and it's, it's one of my favorite notes that I've gotten from you over the years with, with networking. And in some ways, I guess one of the secrets to networking within sport massage, at least at the, no, I can't even say it's at the, the collegiate level, but if you're working with a collegiate team, be on very good grounds with the athletic trainer. Cause I've been fortunate that an athletic trainer that I worked with, uh, the short version of the story is I got an opportunity to work with a women's professional soccer team that came to the area. And I got a phone call out of the blue and it said, Hey, I'm athletic trainer with this team. Um, I got your name from this athletic trainer that I had worked with five years previous, or it might've even been longer than that. And they're like, you know, we heard you, you do sport massage. Can you come work on our, our women's team? And I'm like, yeah, I'll clear my schedule. I'll be over soon. So it's, <laughs> I mean, so, you know, you treat everyone with at least the men of Monicum of respect, but it's, yeah, I guess as a way, like have a good relationship uh, with the athletic trainer and that, that pays off uh, directly. Like you can communicate, they have your trust. If you say, Hey, something's off with this athletes, whatever potential injury or whatnot. And they, they love being in the loop right away. And they'll, they'll send, you know, athletes to you be like, uh, I can sort of slam my thumb into this, but you know what, go see Tom, he's way better at it and, and things like that. So that relationship is uh, critical. And I think sometimes uh, overlooked in, in kind of the sport world. It's like, Love those trainers because I mean they'll they'll do anything for you too if something comes up emergency. But well, and some some trainers have it in their minds that they only want to know what they know, and so you have to you have to play within that ballpark too. So getting to know who that person is and what their training is and all of that is helpful in maintaining a good relationship. I, the story that I tell a lot of times is I was uh, one of the first days that I ever worked at the Seattle Supersonics. Um, and, and the backstory is that um, Pat Archer was contacted to bring some therapists in because the team believed in, in massage, but some of the people that they had had previous to Pat Archer's association with them had kind of taken the attitude that I can solve anything and, you know, didn't want to be directed by the trainer. So we were under very strict um, rules that if anything was outside of what had been written down on the sheet of paper that we were given for an individual athlete, it had to be 
if we wanted to do anything other than that, we had to go through the trainer to get it okayed beforehand. Well, being that I am who I am, I was watching as an athlete was coming towards where we were set up to do the massage. And he was limping very noticeably. And so I waited until he got to the table and I got him, I said, gee, did you hurt yourself on the, on the practice court today? And he said, no, why do you ask? And I said, well, you appear to be limping. He said, no, I always limp which I thought was an odd statement out of a professional athlete. I said, really? Interesting. Looked at my piece of paper, there was nothing about that. So I went about doing the amount of time that we had figured out and I got done a little bit early. How'd that happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to fill in the time somehow. So I checked his leg lengths and he was off that much, Oof. you know, like two and a half inches off. Now, granted, this is a person who's six, eight, um, <laughs> bones are a little bit bigger than mine, but that's a lot. So I did some pelvic stabilization movement and some resistance work. And I didn't tell him why I was doing it. I didn't tell him what to expect and nothing checked his leg links and they were, I had to go back and forth eight times from the apparently long leg to the other one. But after the eighth time, he was even. So he swings off the table. I say, always swing off the table and land on, with both feet on the ground at the same time. Otherwise you'll be reloading your, your body in a different way. He goes, oh, nobody's ever told me that. So he stands up, he stands, starts walking away from me, got about six steps from me, stopped and he looked down at his body and he looked over his shoulder and damn man, I'm not limping. <laughs> and I went, please go sit in the locker room and wait until the trainer comes to talk to you. I have to go speak with the trainer. So I went, stood in line waiting to talk to the, <laughs> the trainer. I said, you know, I was, the piece of paper didn't say anything about this athlete having a limp, but I noticed it. So I did a, a little bit of different work to do that. Athletic trainer kind of gets up and you got to understand he was about my age now, then, um, and he was about five foot six and just about the same dimension if you measured him around. You know, he was just a little fire plug. And um, he says, ah, and left the room. And I basically said, you've seen this athlete a whole lot more than I have, but can you go in and have him walk for you and see if what I did makes sense to, you know, continue doing that. Mm -hmm. So I go back and I'm setting my room up going, oh, I hope I didn't screw myself today. <laughs> So I'm standing there and, you know, in the facility, all the doors were eight feet tall. They weren't like regular doors. They were eight foot tall doors. And this double set of eight foot tall doors come blasting open and here's the trainer. What did you do? I've known that athlete for 12 years. That's the first time I've ever seen him walk without a limp. And my response was, do I still have a job? <laughs> <laughs> he says, well, depending on what your answer is, um, you might have more work than you think. And I said, okay. So he says, I'll be right back. And he went and got a anatomy book. He says, I'm kind of visual. I, I need to see what you're talking about. So I told him and, and walked him through the whole thing. And one of the side pieces of information I had was that he was about to have a hip replacement done because mm. age it, in his in his terms it was just arthritis and age that that was why he was getting it done i said well jump up here on the table and i went through the same exercise and he was maybe this far off so i got done and i you know took maybe two minutes three minutes to do what i had to do and i got him off the table and he stood up and he he walked around the room and looking at me. 
He says, okay, every time that you're here, you're going to have to work on him and you're going to have to work on me. <laughs> so, Am I getting paid for both? <laughs> we got paid from the time we walked in the place until we left, depending on whether we saw one person or 10 people. Gotcha. You know, we got the same amount of money, whether we, you know, however many people we were working on. And so um, we, we actually put off his hip replacement for two years because wow. of the work that we were doing. And, you know, he was comfortable, you know, and, and that was the biggest thing was just being comfortable again. So here again, all I was doing was letting him know that I wasn't just a set of hands that was a drone. I, I was thinking about why things were going wrong. And that garnered me some um, space to do what I needed to do. And he, he stopped saying, well, you can only do what I've told you to do. Do what you think is best became the, the watch words after that. And okay. Pat Archer was the same way, you know, so um, build that relationship with that trainer in the best way that you possibly can, you know, and you have to be humble some of the time and, and say, yes, sir, and no, sir, or yes, ma'am, or no, ma'am. Um, because some of them do feel like they're on a different plane from the rest of us. Sure. So yeah. I mean, let them be there. Yeah. All sorts of motivations can drive people's actions and, and attitudes, but I, uh, I mean, gosh, we covered a lot of really good ones. Are there, I just, if, if you have any other ones like course works that you would maybe define as non massage, but still have helped you in your sport, sport field. If, I mean, we did cover a lot of good points so if nothing else jumps out. That's fine. Well, I, I pointed out in the other interview that some of the people that I have, um, uh, followed a lot were were definitely sports and movement therapy kind of people the ones that are non-massage um you know things like learning movement in a way that your own body works like you do with with working in the, in the um dojo you know you you have a different relationship with your body when you yourself move. Um, there are therapists who are great at what they do, but they don't do anything themselves. You know, they don't go out and paddle a canoe. They don't, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, so they don't associate, I, or maybe I'm putting that on them, but I don't think that they associate with the bodies that they're working on in the same way if they don't know how to move their body. I've, been a water baby all my life and I know how to swim I know all of those things but helping a person who is at that really high level to do the things that are the best for them to be able to do turn in personal bests every time that they go in the pool or whatever you kind of have to know on your body what they need to have happen um, same thing, you know, I mean, I took my career, you know, lefts and rights, a lot of different places, I became a scuba instructor. And so I'm, I'm familiar with the top of the water, but I'm also familiar with the bottom of the water, too. <laughs> so, so I think that's an analogy, you, you kind of have to look at the whole depth of the person. And if you have a better experience yourself in that depth, then you're going to be better off. Um, whether it's Pilates or, or um, the different kinds of yoga or whatever is out there, listen to your, your body and that'll tell you how to work with other bodies. Awesome. That's kind of a broad statement, but that's, it's it's uh it's simple it's simple like in that simplicity is what makes it beautiful because it's like just just move experience movement how you need to move and and things like that and, so 
when you get my age, just getting out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> What's not working today? <laughs> so, Tom, uh, so many wonderful anecdotes and stories and, and information. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, can't wait. My pleasure. And I wish we were able to be on the deck together, you know, like yesterday. Absolutely. But, um, absolutely. But, hey, um, hopefully, when, hopefully, when we next get a chance, I'll be there if somebody wants to hire me. I, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you again, Tom. Thank you for joining us, folks. The mission of Massage Tools Podcast is to inspire. So help us inspire you, ask questions, leave suggestions in the comments section. Give us a like if you enjoyed the video. And if you wanna see more content, please click that subscribe button, turn on your notifications, and hey, check out these links for other videos here.